He has 15 million followers on YouTube. I'm glad you guys get to live with me. Where he posts a daily show targeting an audience made of teenagers and children. Hey, yo, good morning, little guy. What? what? Goddamn, it's good to see you guys. YouTube has been boring lately, I am not gonna lie. So if you're anything like me, you found Logan Paul and his brother Jake unavoidable. Two ex-Vine stars who not only transitioned their millions of fans from the defunct platform, but went on to find double and triple their Vine audiences on YouTube. A feat that several celebrities and brands with similar or even much larger off-YouTube audiences have failed to translate. With careers marred in controversy, both real and fake, Logan Paul and Jake Paul and Rice Gum and Tana Mojo force us to ask real questions about the power of these viral superstars and the influence that their content and actions have on their predominantly young audience. What built this empire? Was it brilliant business acumen? What's up, Jake Paul biz? Was it luck, controversy, or something else entirely? Hi. I'm Jarvis, and I'm tired of doing the video essay voice. Most likely, the way that you found this video, and probably the way you found this channel, is by YouTube recommendation, or what we affectionately refer to as the algorithm. When we say the algorithm, we're actually referring to like five different places where you can be recommended videos on YouTube. Maybe you came to YouTube for this video, maybe you were here already, but odds are, you're gonna stick around for a while because the algorithm is really good at keeping us here. The average amount of time that somebody spends watching videos when they visit YouTube, is 60 minutes. And 70% of all videos watched on the platform come from YouTube recommended suggestions. So clearly they're doing something right. Or are they? Today, I wanna to talk about the YouTube algorithm, how it came to be, and attempt to explain the rapid rise of creators like Logan Paul and Jake Paul, and pretty much any creator who's had explosive growth in the last year. I'm looking at you, Drew Gooden. God bless you, little stinker, you. And I'll also look at the incentives and biases inherent in the algorithm. Mainly, I just wanna blame YouTube for enabling Logan Paul, but with data. There's a lot to unpack here. This is probably gonna be my longest video. Let's start with the word algorithm. So what is an algorithm? Well, I typed it into Google and it says, a process or set of rules to be followed in calculations or other problem solving operations, especially by a computer. That was unnecessarily complicated. Algorithm is just a fancy word for a recipe, a series of steps to solve a specific problem. So if instead of saying, you've got to try my apple pie recipe, I said, you've got to try my apple pie algorithm, it would be weird, but it would basically mean the same thing. So just as taking pie crust and apples and whatever else goes into an apple pie is an example of following a recipe. YouTube taking your watch history and the watch history of every other user on the platform and combining that with the millions of videos on the platform and running a bunch of calculations and ultimately giving you like a list of recommended videos, that's a perfectly reasonable example of following an algorithm. So how does YouTube's algorithm actually do its magic? It leans on the field of machine learning and more specifically, a subset of machine learning appropriately titled recommendation systems. Machine learning is essentially a field of computer science dedicated to building programs that can learn from their mistakes. You know how when you were a kid you touched a hot stove and burned your hand and learned never to do that again? You never, go try right now, I'll wait. Ow. So just as you learn not to touch hot surfaces as a kid, or just now, you can teach a computer to, I don't know, recognize cats based on a bunch of random photos where there are some cats in some of them. This is a cat. Cool. This is also a cat. Got it. Is this a cat? Um, it's got a lot of the same colors as the last photos you showed me. I'm gonna go with yes. Sorry, that's a photo of a tree. Okay. All right, yeah, I won't factor in color as much next time. Is this a cat? Yes. No. Damn it. That's actually pretty close to how machines learn. They don't understand much, so they just try to make guesses and then you tell them if they're right or wrong, and hopefully over time, with enough data, they're right more than they're wrong. And if you thought this was a joke, Google did actually make an algorithm to find cat videos on the internet, so. 
YouTube's recommendation algorithm is no exception. I mentioned recommendation systems earlier. All that is is an area of research around giving computers information about people and asking computers to recommend things to people that they haven't seen. So you can do this for like movies or books or friends. Amazon is probably one of the earliest examples of this at scale. Amazon will take the information about things you buy, things you don't buy, things that people who buy similar things to you buy or don't buy. Also products that you've looked at elsewhere on the internet off of Amazon, which is why you can look at a product on a website and suddenly you're getting like Facebook ads for it or like Amazon recommendations for it. But that's a topic for another video. So Amazon collects all this data and crunches all the numbers and r recommends that I buy a TV after I've already bought a TV. This, this is the height of artificial intelligence. All right, all right, but hear me out. Do you want a subscription for televisions? So the technology isn't perfect, but it's everywhere. From your Netflix watch recommendations to your Facebook feed to like all of these algorithmic feeds and like Instagram and Twitter and stuff now, all powered by some of the same techniques. Today, most of the videos watched on YouTube come from the videos that YouTube recommends, but that wasn't always the case. You wouldn't always go to YouTube and watch videos for hours on end. You'd be brought there by a friend sharing a video on AIM or MySpace. Am I old? Or you'd go to the YouTube homepage, which was essentially handpicked videos by YouTube and like whatever the most popular videos were. The YouTube homepage was hugely influential for creators because everyone saw the same homepage. So when a creator was actually featured on that homepage, that could mean huge things for the growth of their channel. I remember back in the day, Shane Dawson was always up there and then Vlogbrothers had their big break there with Accio Deathly Hollows, which was great for them, but sucked for the creators who never caught the eye of the decision makers at YouTube. Now, these original recommendations may have been handpicked due to technical limitations of the time, but it also may have been a strategic decision. There's this phrase in the startup world that goes, design for the users you want, not the users you have. By manually featuring their ideal content on the front page, YouTube could subliminally influence both their passive audiences and content creators. Because if you promote Shane Dawson or Vlogbrothers, they're going to influence more people and then there are going to be more creators that are influenced by them, which sort of feeds into creating the communities and the users that you want. This allowed for the platform to control its direction of growth. And it did grow. It cultivated interesting creators with cool communities who were highly engaged. And then it got bought by Google in 2006 and ads came onto the platform a year later. Ads would throw a wrench into the, the value equation for YouTube, but at this point their main priority priority was still building their audience. They wanted users to come back regularly to the platform and the easiest way to do that was by emphasizing subscriptions. Subscriptions had always been there, but by emphasizing channels, YouTube transitioned from this like online video repository to a place where like creators with brands could fully exist. Back then the only way that YouTube knew that you liked content was if you subscribed and eventually they added the like button and neither of those things really matter anymore, but that's coming later in the video. So YouTube was like, you like this content? Well, click this button and when you come back, we'll have all of your subscriptions ready for you to watch. And in return, we'll reward the creator with a regular audience to watch their stuff, which is like very beautiful, very pure in a way. A growing weakness in this whole equation though is for new users who weren't subscribing or just didn't have accounts, they still saw the same static homepage. And, and as YouTube grew and its audience diversified, the effectiveness of this like one size fits all recommendation began to wane. But if you could tailor your recommendations to each user's preferences, you could increase the effectiveness of the front page and get more engagement and make a lot more money. Advertising went through a similar thing. Like back in the day, it used to be all about banner ads on websites and now ads are so specific. Hey, remember that jacket you thought about buying last week? Yeah. How do, you, how do you know about that? Everything on the internet is tracked now. Do you want it? There's a sale. Uh, no, I'm good. How about the new iPhone? Do you want the new iPhone? No, actually, my phone is working just fine. Yeah, we predict stuff now too. Anyway, that's essentially what's happening here. Eventually this led to YouTube deprioritizing subscriptions and leaning completely on recommended videos. The first attempt at recommendations though was based on clicks. And this was kind of easy to game. And this is where we saw like clickbait at its worst a few years ago. But in 2015, they changed the algorithm to be based on watch time. And they saw significant increases in the amount of time that people were spending on YouTube. They ended up releasing a paper the next year that detailed some of the changes that they were making. And in this paper, they essentially explain how the algorithm works, but it's a computer science research paper, so it's pretty dense for the average reader. But lucky for you, I have a degree in computer science 
And I took a class on machine learning once, so I'm very qualified to talk about this. Essentially recommending videos on YouTube is a really hard problem because YouTube is huge. It has like 2 billion users and hours of video are uploaded every minute and new stuff is happening all the time. People are watching videos, people are uploading videos and the algorithm has to keep up. So in order to keep up, YouTube has taught a computer how to recommend videos. Remember our computer that could recognize cats from earlier? How could I forget? This time, instead of recognizing cats, it's gotta recognize the best videos for watch time, which directly or indirectly leads to money in YouTube's pocket. Every time you refresh YouTube, homepage, it's taking its millions of videos and filtering those down into dozens that are ordered by how much time YouTube thinks you'll spend watching those videos. And the main thing that YouTube knows about you, the viewer, is your watch history and the watch history of everyone else on the platform. Also some other stuff like how old it thinks you are and what country it thinks you live in, but mainly your previous watches and your previous searches, which it knows for sure. And with every recommendation that YouTube gives you, it's placing small bets on the videos that it thinks you and users like you will watch. Each time you actually watch one of YouTube's recommendations, the algorithm gets a little bit more confident about its understanding of you, the user, users like you, and who the video that you watched might appeal to in the future. If me and my friend Russell Russell only watch Casey Neistat and video essays about film and television, like lessons from the screenplay and every frame of painting. Rest in peace, every frame of painting. The algorithm already knows that me and my friend Russell are similar users, just based on our watches alone. So when Nerdwriter, a creator that maybe I've never seen, makes a video about Casey Neistat and Russell watches it, it's highly likely that I get recommended the video because it knows that similar users to me are watching Nerdwriter and it knows that I click on videos that have to do with Casey Neistat. It's a good bet. And if I do watch that video, the algorithm would be like, wow, that worked? Let me try recommending this to other people like this guy. The paper pretty much confirms that it does this when it says, our final ranking objective is constantly being tuned based on live A-B testing results, but is generally a simple function of expected watch time per impression, which essentially means that when the algorithm sends you a video, it's saying, I think you're gonna click on this nerd's video and watch it for roughly 10 minutes out of obligation before ultimately getting bored in the third act. But hey, 10 minutes of watch time ain't bad. So here you go. If the video keeps winning bets for the algorithm, it's gonna wanna show it to larger and larger audiences audiences, ultimately making videos viral from within YouTube. YouTube has gotten so good at squeezing watch time out of recommendations that it barely cares about your subscriptions anymore. Suddenly, YouTube trusts its own understanding of you based on your watch history more than it trusts you telling it what you like. Although explicit feedback mechanisms exist on YouTube, thumbs up and down, in product surveys, etc. we use the implicit feedback of watches to train the model, where a user completing a video is a positive example. In plain English, this says, we know you can like, comment, and subscribe, but we don't give a f We just care about what you watch. So that's a thing. Now that we know a little about the algorithm and what it values, let's finally talk about Logan and Jake Paul. Nowadays, they're the inescapable faces of YouTube, but it wasn't always that way. They used to be the inescapable faces of Vine, and they started their channels at zero subscribers, just like the rest of us. But they had a huge advantage, which seems obvious, right? Like they were famous on another platform, so they had an audience already. But what allowed them to grow far bigger audiences on YouTube is that YouTube already knew a lot about their audience. We're talking about a generation of fans that grew up on YouTube, so most definitely, all of the fans from Vine had YouTube accounts or had been on YouTube before or knew something about the platform. And when that existing audience that was probably already coming to YouTube came to YouTube for a Logan Paul video, it taught YouTube who their audience was. YouTube is like, oh, I already know these people and there's a ton of them. So let me go ahead and recommend your video to the other people that are like these kids. They're kids, Let, let's not kid ourselves, right? Let's not kid ourselves. And the algorithm was able to make those connections without any intervention because it learns on its own machine learning. Because they had so many people coming out of the woodwork to watch their videos, the algorithm could learn very, very fast how to recommend their videos. For many people, it takes them a while to reach this threshold of algorithmic growth. Like take Drew Gooden, for example, who was producing wonderful content with like 5,000 subscribers. And then one day he hit the threshold and then just skyrocketed to 100K subscribers. And now he's at what, like 800K? Because YouTube figured it out. YouTube figured out how to recommend his videos to his audience. But for Jake and Logan Paul, it didn't have to wait because it had the data instantly to know you know, who to recommend. The algorithm is gonna keep putting the content in front of bigger and bigger audiences until it's wrong, then it's gonna like back off a little bit, and then it's gonna keep trying and trying again. So I'm actually surprised that Logan Paul and Jake Paul aren't bigger. <laughs> it's possible that they've like saturated the obvious audience for them to the algorithm. And that's how it works. I mean, here's Jake Paul talking on his 
uh, Jake Paul Biz channel about how to be famous on the internet. On YouTube, I just came onto the platform like 100 days ago I started vlogging, and I immediately looked at the other biggest YouTubers because I didn't really know what I was doing, and I took little ideas and things that they were doing that, that had the most views, and I implemented them into my videos. Um, for example, like trampolines, uh, overnight challenges, making forts, like things like that were getting a lot more views on their pages, and so I was like, okay, I'm just gonna do this stuff every day. Yeah, so the problem with this advice is that following trends doesn't exactly work for everyone, which is why there are so many Casey Neistat clones and BuzzFeed clones. Without that huge audience to kickstart the algorithm, it's gonna take a very long time to teach the YouTube algorithm that you are like the same thing as BuzzFeed, which probably isn't gonna happen, you know? This is the new story of growth on YouTube. You can see this confidence and learning played out in the metrics. Most creators get a regular number of subscribers per day, which suggests to me that this is just the tier of confidence that the algorithm has in the videos. And eventually you have a viral video or hit some threshold that like gets you into to other tiers. But the bottom line here is that YouTube is the decision maker for how many views a video gets. What did we learn? So YouTube could once control the growth of its platform, but those days are long over. It's relinquished that responsibility to an algorithm, an algorithm that no one can understand because the machine learns on its own. All we can understand is the inputs that go into it. And the algorithm that YouTube is betting its whole business on only cares about one thing, predicting what you watch next. It doesn't care about what you'll watch in a month or what will add value to your life, which is part of the problem. It's not that it can't care about those things, it's just that they're much fuzzier and hard to quantify for an algorithm. They talk about that in the paper a little bit. And I also don't know what's been cracking lately. I mean, like this stuff is, is always developing and it's been like two years since this paper came out. So it's definitely changed since then. But the bottom line either way is that YouTube takes our passive behaviors and uses them to manipulate our attention. Basically every social media is doing this. But when an algorithm with influence over 2 billion users has such a singular goal, there are gonna be unintended side effects, especially when money is in the mix, like Elsagate, where content farms algorithmically generated videos to exploit the algorithm and make a ton of money off of kids' content. Humans may not understand how this thing works anymore, but I don't think it's a very good excuse because humans code the values and biases of the system. I guess I'm just trying to say that with great power comes great responsibility, and I'm not trying to talk shit on algorithms even though I just did that for 15 minutes. I just want people to be aware of what's driving our actions. Like these algorithms are super cool. They're like saving people time, they're helping people out, helping them find what they want faster. It's mostly coming from a good place, I think, but if left unchecked, people like Logan Paul are mathematical certainties and will certainly like come up again. And we just gotta take responsibility for that. Um, yeah, I don't want this to be too negative. Like a lot of good has come from this. That's all I wanted to talk about today. Stay woke, I guess.